carefully. He defers the exclusively to God and then by, by saying that only God is good alone so he's saying to him in effect that this is a title that I'm not worthy of and the evidence of that is when Christ subsequently tells him what to do to get the eternal life by keeping the commandments the man responds notice in verse 20 his teacher I have kept this he has understood that when I've initially called you this good teacher when I redress him, I will simply call him teacher. But did, and he's understood that. And Jesus actually looks straight at him. I'm, I'm continuing now from where you left off. So, on and father, mother, and he said to him, All these things I have obeyed since my youth. Now, Jesus looking straight at him, Jesus liked him, and Jesus said to him, One thing is still lacking. Go sell all you have and give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. And then come here, follow me. Yeah. Follow Jesus. Yes. And then he couldn't keep that, so he had to walk away. And then and Jesus. Yeah, but that's nothing. There's nothing. All, all he's saying there mm -hmm. is that by you keeping the commandments, very good. However, what is befalling you is your riches. So your riches are not of no um, understanding to you. If you want to follow me, give those to the poor. That will make you yeah. quint that will quintessentially make you one yeah. who, who is given, who's that example as one associated associated with me. Give your riches and yeah. follow me. That's what you say. But, so let me say one mean, thing but I what is it? You. What is it within that follow passage which has yeah. made you think there's more to it than meets the eye? Straightforward. Well, All he's saying basically. Yes, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. So let me say what we agree with each other about. What we agree with each other is that Jesus is saying that unless you have kept the law perfectly, uh, which involves also giving to the poor and not being tied to your riches, unless you have followed the law perfectly, you can't be saved. That's the only way to be saved, you follow the law perfectly. And then he says, what, that, what does that mean for you? It means leaving your possessions following me. Now, what happens? At that time, the, the, the disciples were amazed at his words. Um, uh, particularly, because the next thing that Jesus says, explaining what you just said, is how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom. Yeah, so all he's saying there. Yeah, is exactly. The, yeah, I think I agree with that. Yeah, but really the point I'm trying to stress to you, yeah. which you need to consider deeply, yeah. not, for the, not for the sake of a polemic where I'm trying to get one over you, yeah. it's simply. Look, when that young man approaches Jesus, Jesus is entitled to be called a good teacher because we know he's a good person. Hence, a title is a common Hebraism that when you refer to someone of a big character, you give him a title of respect. In this country, what happens in schools, they simply call a teacher sir or miss. They don't give a title of respect. So a title of respect in the Hebrew custom would be to say good teacher. That's giving him that title. Jesus pounces on that point. Yes. He pounces on by saying, why do you call me good? Only God is good. So he's actually saying, listen, humble, but I'm humble. I only, this is only a title to God alone. And the fact is that when he, when he didn't tell what to do to keep, when he didn't tell the young man what to do to keep the eternal life, very important. He says, teacher, I have kept these commandments since I was a boy. Immediately it's noticeable. He drops the title good, simply calls him teacher. Hence the young man has understood. He's rebuked me for calling him good. He's given that title to God. When I redress him, I make sure I only call him teacher. Can I Does that make sense? Does that make sense what I'm saying to you? So hence, by proxy, he can't be God, you see. He definitively can't. If, for example, you were, say, you were to say to me, Oh, you're the only knowledgeable person here. I would say, whoa, whoa, whoa. No. Why are you saying I'm knowledgeable? Only Philip is knowledgeable. Hence, by default, I'm excluding that type from myself and giving it to Philip. Because I realize in the grand scheme of things that Philip would have much more knowledge than I have. Hence, I give him that title. So in this respect, it's humbling. It's a common Hebraism. Hebraism means certain inactions followed within the culture of the Jews in which they give people for high disposition a, a title of honor and they humble themselves by deferring that so he's actually deferring that title to God alone now furthermore to your point second second response to the rhetorical understanding if he indeed wanted the young man to consider who he really was ie his claim to be God well the young man does not go away making that conclusion 
know, which is why Jesus looked at me. He liked I repeat me. that again slowly. Well, so if it, if it was a rhetorical question, are you following what I'm saying to you? If you're not... I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So what I'm saying, if it was rhetorical, and as Philip said, he wants a young man to consider who he really is, then that, the young man does not go away with that conclusion that he's claiming to be God. So that doesn't really fit the argument. So second point I made, it would only fit if he said, do you know? If, if when, when he calls Jesus a good teacher, Jesus would have said to him, do you know why you call me good? Then it makes sense, a rhetorical question according to the grammar. That, you know, think about who, what you're really saying. But he doesn't say that, he goes, why do you call me good? Now, gentlemen, you're, I'm assuming Oxford, you're, I know you got to Oxford Uni. How about yourself? Uh, I didn't go to Oxford. Oh, you didn't? But I saw you, sorry, I beg your pardon. I think your American colleague who asked, so we saw that young lady, she's, um, um, anyway, point being is that if you read the same account in, Ma and why did I, there's a reason why I mentioned, because sometimes it, it's bizarre how incomprehensibility is lacking on the part of certain people you speak to. If you read the same account of this incident in Mark 10, 17, 18, it's narrated in Matthew 19, 16 to, 8, to, to 20 to 19. Where the, well, the rich young man comes to G Jesus, notice carefully, gentlemen. He, they say, he says in that account, Teacher, what good thing must I do to see eternal life? So, we re so Matthew, observing Mark's account, has a problem with this. He's observed more. Why would Jesus say, um, why do you call me good? Only God is good alone. So Matthew, the second gospel, you're aware of this, aren't you? According to Christian scholars, Matthew, Mark is the first gospel. Although you have it as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Mark is the first gospel. Everybody should know that. So when Matthew, who's got Mark, he's got, so Mark, you know, Matthew and Luke use Mark as a source for their gospel. So Matthew is really Mark's account. This is all Christian scholars say this. So when Matthew, is really, he's got such a problem with this narrative that he rearranges the words. He says now, he doesn't no longer say good teacher. He simply says, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? So now he's changed, rearranging the words to say what generically, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? But in Mark's account, he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good alone. So Matthew rearranges the word. John Barton at Oxford University, he makes this point as well, that they've rearranged because Mark has got a problem. What's happening is a Christology developing. When you look at Mark's gospel, the first gospel, he's, Christ speaks much about himself and the kingdom of heaven. But slowly, slowly, as you go through, the, as an evolution takes place. Where Christ is limited in Mark's gospel, Matthew covers up those limitations. So this is an example which I've cited forth. There's another example where the boat is sinking in Mark's gospel. In Mark's account, you know, you know the incident, don't you? Uh, the the the, um, the associate of Jesus, the disciple, says to him, "Listen carefully, gentlemen. It's very important. Teacher, don't you care we're sinking?" In Mark's account, when you read Matthew's account, it says, "Lord, save us from sinking." I repeat, I just do that slowly. Because it may, I'm, I'm showing an evolution which occurs relentlessly in the New Testament. In Mark's account, where, where the boat is sinking, the disciple in the boat says to Jesus, Teacher, don't you care we're sinking? In Matthew's account, the same incident, he says, Lord, save us from sinking. So what have we observed twofold? He replaces the title teacher with the title Lord, or more of an exalted title. In Mark's account, he says, don't you care we're sinking? So it's like a minor rebuke. I mean, what are you going to do? Into Matthew's account, as if to, you know, as if to incline towards an absolute adulation of him. Save us from sinking. So you see the way he's changed it. It's an evolution taking place. Yeah. You, have you understood? Possibly, yeah. Yeah. But as no, it's in, not. As in, as in, that, is a, that is a theory, an interesting theory. It's not a theory, it's relentless. Um, I don't know the Greek one by heart. Um, but it's very plausible that um, the one minute read stories in Gospels were actually much longer events. As in, sorry, I'll down to the side. As in, obviously they're longer events. And it's very plausible that someone says, Lord, save us in. And then straight after he says another thing. And then it's not. It, it, what it's, you quite notice, big, it's quite a big jump. To now, make, what you notice is. Um, two slightly different. Now, what it happens? Uh, 
contradictory statement, which is a big, big jump. Well, listen, and the punchline in both stories is still the same, which is the disciples saying, who possibly is this one that even the wind and also the sea obeys him? The yeah. punchline has not changed. Well, who is the possible one? Who would be the Messiah? It doesn't state in that verse, this must be God, therefore he um, silences the seas. But what I want to, uh, I don't think you've understood the point, with due respect to you both gentlemen. What I'm trying to say, Matthew changes the title teacher to Lord. So obviously if I called you... You're saying he's got a... He's got a agenda. He's got an agenda, yeah. Yes. I'm saying that is... That is, an, that is, that is, a, not, that is not a possibility. Very, that, that, is, that is a very typical sort of um, scholarly criticism way of reading scripture. Um, but just like you agree, um, that many people who are not Muslims who read the Quran wrongly or different parts wrongly or whatever, um, but you have to make a reference to something. So it's like a, it's like a, it's like an evolution of the character of Christ. It's just like a snowball. You know, you get a snowball, small thing. You roll it, it gets bigger and bigger, and it reaches this crescendo in John. So John, you get all these fantastic, self-proclamatory, elevatory titles, I am statements, which you don't find in the earliest synoptic gospels. I am the truth of the way of the life. No man come from the Father but through me. Before Abraham was, I am. Uh, bef um, uh, the Father and I are one. He that has seen me has seen the Father. All these self-proclamatory statements. So, so, so um, the, the, the previous guy we chatting to would, um, would say all those statements are not any proof of divinity. Would you, would you be more on the side that no, no. they prove divinity but they're just wrong? No. Sorry. What I'm saying to you, now, John's, you know John's Gospel is commonly understood by Christian scholarship like Bruce Metzger and F.F. Bruce. That it went, yeah, by Christian scholars like Bruce Metzger, the greatest Christian um, uh, textual critic since over the last, um, um, around about, let's say, 100 years. Bruce Metzger, he's, he's passed away now. He, 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 was, he, he was a student of F.F. Bruce, who in turn is a student of uh, Bart Him. But anyway, let me quickly wrap up the point. John's Gospel went through three uh, uh, different authors with five stages of redaction, meaning editing. So what happens commonly in Muslim Christian discourse, Muslims will cite certain verses from John's Gospel as evidence that, like, he, like what the, like the brother did, he quoted John 17, 3, or John 14, 28. Christians will commonly respond by referring to the verses I've just mentioned. But even those verses, when you apply the context of each and every one of those verses, which give you a, a, maybe an inclination of Christ's somewhat even further elevated position, when you apply the context, it's not what is understood from the Trinitarian perspective. So the Father and I are one is a great example for you to follow. The Christians commonly use that verse. I'm not sure if you use that verse. But if you read the context, all he's trying to say that those Jews who do not accept him, they're not his sheep. Those who do accept him, they are his sheep. So we just summarily and without me, because I know the verse all by heart anyway, but the point I'm trying to raise to you, when it says the Father and I are one, it's just in the purpose of bringing the Jews back to worshipping God alone. Simple as that. Nothing else in, in addition to that. And if you look at all those other verses, John 14, 9, He that has seen me has seen the Father. Or before, if you read the context of all these verses, and then you apply the, and you apply the appropriate um, Old Testament verses which they're supposed to, which they're supposedly referencing, it's not what is... Uh, um, clear from that particular Old Testament prophecy. So, John 8.58 is a classic example where Christ apparently says, um, before Abraham was, I am. And the Greek word is ego eimi. But when you go to Exodus 7.1, it doesn't say that. In the Hebrew it says, which is basically, I will be who I will be. But even if you were to take the other account, what does it say? It doesn't say, in, in the Septuagint, it says, um, Ego Amy, hold on, I am the one. Because Ego Amy is a self proclamatory statement, like in John 9 5, that, that, that blind man. When he's asked, I mean, uh, I mean, um, are you the guy who, he's, you know, he cured of his blindness? And he said, Ego Amy. Are you following me? I am. It's like self identifying himself. So in John 8 58, self identifying as the Messiah who Abraham rejoiced in the coming of his days. Because if you notice the passage in John 10 23, when the Jews surround him and say to him, Are you the Messiah? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. And he says, I've already told you so, yet you are not my sheep. I mean, he's already affirmed to them unilaterally John 2, John 4, John 8, John 10, that he's the Messiah. But out of obstinance and uh, skullduggery, they did 
not want to follow what he has to say. So hence, yeah. Um, okay. Sorry if I've ra I'm just saying this for the sake of the recording, because earlier the other gentleman challenged me about the Cambridge professor statement. I have found his article. Yeah, you can ask him. I have, I have found the article that the previous person said I have fabricated. It is in the Tyndale House Bulletin of Cambridge um, from 27th of November 2020, talking about the Jesus Speak Greek. The author is Dr. Peter Williams, principal at, at Tyndale House, and uh, for a time he was. Um, what, what did so he let, say? Let him say let well, he say. says, well, let me quote him here. I mean, in a way, he said what well, I said. In a sense, it doesn't matter. I'm quoting now. In a sense, it doesn't matter at all what languages Jesus spoke. It doesn't matter. Whether he. Whether he taught in Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek, most Christians in the world today will be reading his lessons in translation anyway. But the understanding that it is perfectly plausible that Jesus may have spoken Greek helps us understand his life a little more clearly. Not as someone who lived in an isolated rural outpost, but as a member of a vibrant and cosmopolitan community. It also encourages us that encourages us that there is no need to imagine a gulf between okay, what Jesus originally said and what is recorded in the gospel. I'm okay. putting verbatim. Yeah, but yeah, so yeah, no, it's, it's now, now. One minute, brother, brother, one minute, brother, one minute. Please, 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 brother, just one second, please. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know what I mean. I wasn't. Yeah. So basically, there's two, brother, brother, but one second, brother. Well, two well, points, two points are noted. There you go. Even, even. One second, guys. One second. There's two points here. Number one, he said it doesn't matter. Number one, the first two sentences, he, he basically this particular individual, yeah. so it doesn't matter if he spoke Greek, Aramaic, or Hebrew. Oh, okay. And then even an, obser an observant individual, such as the brother here, yeah. has said it's plausible. <laughs> what does plausible mean? It's possible. No. But he doesn't. He doesn't say he didn't speak Greek. Yeah. Now, exactly. in order for the, <laughs> in that, order. That's also what I said earlier. You can play back the video. I said he's got this guy said he most like likely. That does not mean he must have. And I also said in the video earlier. <laughs> that it really doesn't matter at the end of the day because what matters is the content of what was spoken not the you see no eminent no eminent new testament scholar has come out verbatimly to say that jesus spoke greek no well, everybody but everybody plausible that he really spoke yeah, but the, what does plausible mean to you but, yeah. no, but he's saying but the african made this but, decision is yeah. no, no, no i don't want to go around i don't want to just conclude this I believe from the New Testament, having read it, I've read little bits of it in Greek. No way do I conclude Jesus came to be the Almighty God. No way, Jose. What do I conclude? He claims to be verbatimly a, a, a prophet. Mark 6, 4, Matthew 21, 11, John 17, 3, uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. He claims to be a prophet of God, explicitly. He claims to be the Messiah, explicitly. So, can I just ask you a question? Um, just, um, so, I'm just a little bit confused with, because some of the stuff you were saying with John stuff, um, you was using what so, uh, was it? What his um, sort of criticism? Source criticism? Source criticism? You mentioned wasn't you? Textual criticism. Yeah, sorry, textual criticism. Yeah. Sorry, textual criticism. Um, and the reason you was using that seemed to be because you want to say that John is basically like, potentially lying or not true. Uh, is that right? So, no, can you hear me? Hear me out. Um, just because either. Either it's not saying he's God, or we're using criticism methods. I think you misunderstood so totally what I'm saying. Um, I'll repeat it for your um, certainty. Yeah. So what I'm saying, look, oh, John's Gospel had three different authors, which went through five different stages of redaction. How, how do you know this? So I've read it from Bruce Mesk and F.F. Bruce's yeah, books. This is John's um, Gospel. Yes, Pastor. Read uh, the introduction to John's Gospel by um, Raymond Brown. It's interesting, but that criticism is in... So I want to make my point so you're not left unclear. So what I'm saying to you, one author would have been espousing John 17, 3, John 14, 28. These types of verses which show Christ is referring to God as somebody else other than himself, like in John 17, 3, where the, use of the Greek word apostelos is used in reference to himself, the apostle sent by God, the messenger sent by God. And then Christians will commonly say, oh no, but what about John 10, 30, which appears to be more self-elevatory statements. But what I'm saying to you, if you, when you apply the context of those supposed self-elevatory statements, 
he's not claiming to be God. So, it, but what is happening? That other author, the second author, is trying to put wor words into Jesus' lips as if he said them. The Jesus seminar, a very famous seminar, which was um, conducted a number of years ago, in which Christian scholars got together to understand about you know the Red Letter Bible, for example, what were the express words of Christ. So they ex they exclaimed that I am statements found in the New Testament were the thoughts of the author of that particular gospel. And then he added that into the Jesus' lips as if he said it. I mean, I, less, less, less scholars believe that now. I mean, that, was a, that was kind of a little fact 20, 10, 20 years ago. That's not a fact. So that's a common understanding of modern contemporary scholarship. Now, but it was probably one author. Okay, cite me one. Mean, okay, can you yeah, cite me one person? I can't. See, when you make a claim, you've got to be very careful what you have cited to reference. What do you, you want to say? You just cited one person as well, Raymond Brown, which I just searched up. And yes, he does write about his five possible, as in five sort of... Reduction, five, five, five reduction, editing, yes. Yeah, theory, but that is just a theory, and that's just one person as well. So how can this one person and this one person... It's not just him, it's F.F. F. Bruce, it's uh, Bruce Medscar. These are the greatest Christian scholars you've had over the last 150, 200 years. Mm -hmm. Don Don Carson, well, yeah. So, Another one. Which well, might, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say that. He, he yeah. would say it's one right. I think I can give you a Where does, this, where does Don Carson? Can you show me where Don Carson says that, please? Don Carson. Yeah, John Carson. Actually, I do have it on my Kindle. Good. So. Okay, excellent. I want to hear this one. Okay, good. I think I have it on my Kindle. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say to you, gentlemen, is when you reflect on the, ver the explicit statements, why do you call me good? Think about this carefully, my friend. You're an Englishman. Why do you call me good? There's no one good except for only God alone. Yeah. The young man has understood it. He drops the title good teacher, simply calls him teacher. I guess what's interesting is when, when Thomas, for example, calls him I know, I know, I know this, John 20, 28. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when he bows down and worships, um, my God. My Lord and my God. Yeah. Let me explain um, as a few, and, as you can. And, like, either Thomas is heretical. Yeah. Um, I mean, or, basically, or, or Jesus has got. Um, Right, can I respond to that? So you yeah, understand? Yeah. <laughs> so you refer to John chapter 20, verse 28, yes. in reference to this point where it says that, um, and it says in the Greek, the Lord of me and the God of me. So three, there's about six points I can address to that, but I'll just go for it slowly. Um, number one, in the earliest fragments of the um, P52 document, which is like a credit sized document, which precedes the Codex Sinaiticus, the term my God is not to be found. The term my God is not to be found. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? The earliest manuscripts have that. Have that. Let me explain to you. Before even you have the earliest, the, the earliest manuscripts you have are the Codex Synacticus and the Codex Vaticanus. Okay? Now, even before that, you had a, doc, you had a credit card size fragment referred to the P52 in which the John 2028 20, doesn't have the term my God, it only has my Lord. And my Lord is based upon the Greek word kurios, where others are referred to as kurios as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, where Paul says there are many lords, the same Greek word is there, kurios. So in that, so first, first things first, the early fragment you have of John 2028 20, doesn't have the term my God. Secondly, in the Codex Sinaiticus, <coughs> In the first rendering of the manuscripts of Codex Sinaiticus, so have you found something? I mean, Carson's conclu own conclusion from his commentary is, in short, the internal evidence is very strong, though not beyond dispute, that the beloved disciple is John the Apostle, the son of Zebedee. So that is Don Carson. But not beyond dispute. I mean, well, he's yes. not making a categorical statement, is he, again? But no one is. But they are. Not even Raymond Brown is. That he is. Trust me, he is. I mean, I can look okay. at Raymond Brown. Okay, one minute, I'm gonna, if you want the exact reference, I can, I can get that for you as well. So I again, mean, he just needs. I think you'll be very far-fetched to make a categorical statement yeah. about a five. Oh, guys, listen. If you need to, I don't want unnecessarily to delay you. If you need to go far, yeah, actually, but in yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm trying, well, yeah, no problem. To go and pray as well. So. Yeah. So what I'm trying to for you, gentlemen, to conclude essentially is that Christ spoke of worshiping God and God alone. Mark 12:28. Hear thou, O Israel, your Lord God, the Lord is one. No reference to himself in that. He repeatedly tells those. That my favorite one. Check this out. The last. I promise you. No more than one minute. My favorite verse. Contemporary English version. One I like to use. The Jews. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Jesus heals a paralytic man and says, "Get up. Your sins are forgiven." 
The Jews observe this and they say to themselves, or they think to themselves, Jesus must think he is God. Christ responds by saying, why do you think such evil things? Meaning you thinking that I am God is the evil thought. That's a big job. Well, how, okay, explain to me how it's a big job. Because they're annoyed, but he healed someone. Right. They're always annoyed, but he healed someone. Correct. Seven, for example. And also he, forgave, he, he was um, saying that your sins are forgiven. So when they observe the fact that he's doing both things, forgiving the sins... Like, like he can't forgive sins if he's not God. No, he can't because he is God. No, but notice he says, I do not forgive. He said rather your sins are forgiven. He doesn't say, I forgive your sins, but your sins are forgiven. Now in John 20, 23, he also said that if you, if, uh, to the disciples that if you so wish, you could forgive sins as well. So John 20, 23 shows us this. What I'm trying to address to you here, the, because when they observe what he's done, and they think to himself, Jesus must think he is God. To that very thought or saying, he says, why are you saying such evil things? I mean, you saying or thinking I am God is the evil thought. I mean, how, how is it a jump? I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely bewildered by uh, uh, how is that, is that a jump? Please forgive the sins. They're watching on. There is enemies. They whisper to themselves. Jesus observes them. Why are you thinking such evil things? Well, I'm just saying, we, we see it constantly, but like, they put human commands. Pardon? They put, they, they put regulations over loving people all the time. We know, we, you move for John, you constantly see that. Constantly see the rejection of Jesus. Yes, and what they're trying to do, you see, you know, when they say he must think he's God, and to that thought, he's saying, why do you think such evil five, things? I think, I think oh, yeah, what time is um, it there? Four to five. Can we... Yeah, <laughs> okay, that's yeah. fine. Sorry, I'm sorry if I've rambled. We'll see you next yeah. time. Yeah, definitely. Nice to meet you, Kipinem. Sorry if I've rambled on too much. I'll wouldn't have a All right, sorry. All the best to you. All right, take care of yourself. I hope, I hope I haven't offended, upset you or offended you. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. It's a very good, nice conversation with our Christian friends. I spoke to that um, other South... I think he's from South Korea, maybe last summer. And he's here in Stratford today. So we made the points. Hopefully his colleague as well, inshallah, will reflect on what has been said. Sometimes when I speak to him, I, I like to look straight into their eyes and make them reflect deeply. Another quick message I want to give for the Muslims. What's happening, there's a process in Palestine today. You know, we keep on going demonstrations which are essentially useless. But we've got to put our point of view across, even though it's not going to change anything. But what I would ask you to do, if you're Muslims, if you love the Palestinians, there's one power you've got. Nobody speaks about. 33% of the businesses in London are owned by Muslims. One and a half million Londoners of the nine million Londoners are Muslim. If you really love the Palestinians, don't go to work next week. Don't open your businesses next week. This will help the Palestinians because the, go the government here will then feel the squeeze. They will feel the squeeze of our economy being grasped. So I encourage Muslims, do not open your businesses over the next week. If you can, don't open them because the British economy will directly be affected. That's something we can do as Muslims to help the Palestinians. No one's thought about. I've been to several protests. Farming is carrying on. The, the crushing of the uh, Palestinians are, uh, is, is continuing. This is one power we have. Muslims, I'm appealing to you. If you're businessmen, if you're employers, you, you hold a big say. Your economy. Stop going to work. If you love the Palestinians, you watch the British will fall just like this. That's the way to do it. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa Light, yeah? yeah, it's a clear light in the dark.